Sharaf. Hey, what's with going the, on? With the full, full mustache. Beard, <laughs> beard yeah. <laughs> Good to see I, you, man. Yeah, you too. Um, are, are you out in New York? I'm actually in the Bay Area right now, visiting my folks. So, oh, cool. yeah. Well, thanks for tuning in on a session about ADUs during your yeah. vacation time. But very appropriate, too, because it's this will probably be more Bay Area focus. So yeah, that, actually, my uh, we're building an ADU in my parents' house, so I figured this was oh. a good session to be joining. Oh, okay. You can compare your process to the cottage one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool. So we'll give it a, a couple more minutes here. I like to get started maybe five minutes after if anyone needs to grab a drink or anything. Nate, any updates on um your 1031 thoughts, 1031 exchange thoughts? I appreciate the the conversation. We spoke to an agent and decided it wasn't our time to do a 1031. So that's why I'm joining this call because now we're thinking about adding an ADU. Oh, cool. Awesome. This would be, um, oh, in, in, in East Bay. You... Yeah, at our house. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Which uh, municipality? Contra Costa County. Okay. Unincorporated? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not in, in no, I think you're, you're, you're an incorporated. Rog is incorporated. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's good. If we have a project in, you know, in Orinda, but it's unincorporated Contra Costa, they are super slow. Um, so uh, to be part of a specific muni, not just the county government. Good to know. That's then, a cool insight. If you're looking um, to do um, a 1031, you can... Uh, it's a little more complicated, but if you build an ADU, I don't know how big your lot is, but say you have a lot over 8,000 square feet, you build an ADU in the back, but you build it in such a way that it is prepped for utilities for a lot split, then you can build the ADU, lot split, convert that ADU to a main home, sell half the parcel and 1031 on that. What a great loophole. I don't know if our, I think we have enough square footage, but uh, that's a good thing to look into. Yeah, I believe the requirements are 8,000 square foot lot, and then the smaller of the two, when you divvy it up, um, the smallest you can go is 40% of that original lot size to split off. Got it. Okay. That little tidbit there is just like why I'm uh, so excited to have Jimmy come on to chat with you. Maybe we could just segue now to kind of intro and kind of get started a little bit, but that was why I was just so excited to bring... Um, Jimmy on. He works for a company called Cottage. And I have a couple um, investor friends who've worked with them before and just raved about the process, them being not only just like responsive and just great people to work with, but they also make the whole ADU process from start to finish completely seamless. They handle everything from permits to design all the way to, 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 to building it out for you. Um, and for, I think most people on the call here, are probably based in California, and, and really, if you, if you own a single family home in single uh, California or multifamily, we'll talk about that too, you should really be considering building an ADU. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly, arguably, probably the best way to add value to your property. And if you're thinking about rental income, financial freedom, all those things that people talk about, it really is kind of um, what, what I think is kind of like the, 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 the best path forward or really something you should, should, you should consider. Um, so, and Jimmy, just as a little bit of intro, this group is a mix of uh, friends from college, friends that took my real estate investing course last year, and some new folks as well. Um, but most of these folks um, have an interest in real estate investing, and I just thought it'd be a great, um, great group to bring together. We're going to keep it pretty casual. Jimmy has a presentation that he's going to go through, but if any of you have questions, feel free to type them in um, or just unmute and, and ask. And um, and we'll try to keep it to, to about an hour. So we'll end at about 6.30. Without further ado, go ahead, Jimmy. <laughs> All righty. Uh, welcome, everybody. Cliff, I appreciate you uh, bringing me in. So I'd like this to be as interactive and as interruptive as people would um, like it to be. I can pause. Uh, we can loop back to any slides I have. 
Um, we have uh, quite a few slides. I think it's about 30 slides. So um, I will move quickly through them, um, but please don't hesitate um, to stop me. I won't say any questions after each slide, just interrupt me and, and we'll work it that way. Um, quick uh, introduction um, about myself. Um, let me pull this up. I um, have worked at various startups in the business development and, and sales realm. Um, I took a break after working um, at WeWork to go swing a hammer. So it was kind of my trade school, worked for a general contractor up here in Marin, learned the ins and outs of uh, construction, uh, various trades, and then came across Cottage two years ago um, and came on as their first um, individual contributor salesperson. And I was selling at a time when uh, we didn't have any projects complete. Um, we had one general contractor, so it was like, go with this guy or bust. Um, and we really had to um, find various ways to not just sell the ADU, um, but find various ways to figure out how ADUs work. Um, and so with all that said, um, two years, two and a half years later, um, it's kind of funny to think that now I can um, eat, sleep, and breathe uh, ADUs. And so I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. It's very much a passion of mine. And I would say um, at the end of this presentation, I'm happy to grab time with folks to talk about ADUs. Um, whether or not you're with Cottage, uh, I, I just want more, more housing uh, around the Bay and around the country. Um, so, Let's see. Um, our general email is, is hello at cottage. Um, first name at cottage uh, works uh, to get directly in touch with me. Um, my former colleague, uh, Caleb, this is actually his backyard in Pasadena, and they recently wrapped up uh, an ADU there. Um, so high level cottage's mission, um, we want to make it as easy as possible to build a customized ADU for any property. Um, and we'll talk about, um, you know, what an ideal property is like. Um, customized does not mean high-end custom home. It can, um, but basically it's not choosing from a cookie cutter um, playbook or selection of four floor plans that have to fit in my yard. Um, prefab companies like Cover and Villa and Abodu um, they are great. They are also revolutionizing how ADUs are being built and getting them in the hands of people. Um, there are just different use cases for different scenarios. And um, when it comes to how we've decided to build ADUs, stick built on site, um, there is no site or type of ADU that, that we can't deliver on. Um, so like I said, we build them on site, ground up. Um, this is traditional construction methods. Um, framed, often called stick built, um, and a perceived advantage um, from a homeowner is that I am going to invest dollars in my property in something that was built exactly the same way that my main home was. So there's that continuity um, and there's, you know, this trust in tried and true construction methods. When it comes to resale value, um, it's unclear whether or not um, a house with a prefab unit that's 500 square feet and a house right next door with a stick built ADU of 500 square feet, what that comp value is. Um, if you ask me, knowing how things are built and knowing how uh, prefab structures are built, um, I will place a premium uh, on something that's, that's stick built. All right, um, so we want this to be educational. Um, ideally, everybody can come away with a few nuggets so that when you're talking um, to uh, friends, when you're talking to, um, if you're a, a broker, when you're talking to clients, or if you're an investor and, and assessing properties of your own, um, that you have, you will be able to identify properties that have ADU potential and at least um, be armed with enough to be dangerous um, to, to start an ADU in the feasibility phase. So quick agenda, uh, we want to go through some ADU basics, um, what it is, why California is an ADU haven, uh, and what can be built. Um, we'll then pivot to how do we identify ADU potential? What should I look for in a, in a property? What can people use an ADU for? And, and what is the cost and value of an ADU? 
Um, and my role now, uh, I've transitioned from running our homeowner consultant, our sales team, uh, which focuses on cottage to homeowners on single family residential. I'm now focusing on partnerships with uh, multifamily uh, investors, brokers, and developers. Um, there are uh, a number of advantages if you have the capital to invest in a multifamily um, to add ADUs to that. So we'll, we'll close off with that. Um, so ADUs, accessory dwelling units, uh, often called backyard homes, granny flats, um, second dwellings. Um, a key piece to note, we get a lot of homeowners that call in, they have two acres in Santa Rosa and they want cottage to build an ADU. It's called an accessory dwelling unit. And in order to build and permit an accessory dwelling unit, you need a primary dwelling unit. Uh, so there must be an existing home. Um, largely, they are used for rental income or for housing family. Um, these two buckets are the biggest. They are also, in my experience, um, the most likely to close. If we have uh, a homeowner who's looking to build an ADU for flexible space, home office, uh, or a gym, that's very much a nice to have. Um, and they're, they're a lower likelihood of close on our end. Um, but regardless of the use case, you are going to get an increase in property value. Um, I have a couple of examples that we can look at for comps uh, as far as what we've seen um, an ADU can add to a property's value. So three different typologies, three major typologies are the detached, the attached, it has to share um, at least a little bit of wall space um, or a conversion of an existing structure like a garage. Um, there are also J ADUs. Um, those would be a conversion of an existing space within the existing envelope. Um, we have found those to be more difficult unless uh, an existing property has as-built drawings. So if you're looking to buy a property and you want to put one J ADU and one of these varieties of ADUs, detached, attached, or conversion, you're allowed to do two ADUs, so long as one is an interior conversion J ADU. Um, but I would not recommend going down that route unless it's either a newer home build or you have plans uh, knowing what's behind the drywall of that existing house before you convert it. Hey, hey Jimmy, quick question on the uh, conversion ADU. Yeah. Is that... Um, so my understanding, that's like taking a garage and converting it. Is that normally you like level out the garage and just build on top of what would be the garage? Or is it literally taking the, the four walls and the roof, or like updating that and converting it? Yeah, so it could be any number of things. Um, we'll call it a demo rebuild uh, if we are wiping the entirety of the garage, including the foundation. Um, there are times where maybe the framing is not up to code and we can go one of two routes. We can beef it up. Uh, sister some uh, joists, add in some more structural members um, and, and keep the foundation. Um, there are times when it's not structurally good framing and we'll wipe that and then keep the foundation. The biggest determiner of if we can convert or demo rebuild is the foundation. Um, rule of thumb is detached garage built before 1970, 1980, if you wanna be conservative. Um, that will need a full redo. The garage foundations were built for cars. They were typically four inches thick and they are not deemed um, sufficient for a, a habitable structure. Um, so uh, an easy way to gauge, uh, you know, if you're looking at a property and there's a garage, you might want to convert. Um, if you're able to take a little trowel, dig down um, six to 12 inches on the outside, um, on the perimeter of the garage. And if you see uh, concrete slab and footing go down more than six inches and you see inside and there aren't any major cracks, then you're probably looking um, at a conversion that's $150,000 rather than a demo rebuild of 200, 250. Hmm. Okay, so the big change in California happened in uh, 2019. They passed a law that went into effect for 2020. Um, the greatest hits of what this means is you can build what's called a California exempt ADU so long as it is under 800 square feet which is pretty large, 
um, below 16 feet in height and has a minimum four foot setback at the rear and the side property lines, as well as um, waiving a, prop, a parking requirement if it's within a half mile of public transit. Uh, technicality, that's not as the crow flies, that's as the human walks. Um, so you can basically have your property address in Google Maps, search bus, and then map that out. That's, you know, that can be a deal breaker for people if they have to put in extra parking, um, not because they don't want to, but because their property simply won't uh, allow for it in, in space. Um, and then uh, another piece that uh, people get excited about, but in practice is different. Um, there was this idea that ADUs can be permitted over the counter in 60 days. This is the easiest thing ever to happen to, to building and planning. Um, in reality, planning departments have a 60 day grace period to reply to the first comments. Um, and that means on day 59, city of Pleasanton sends us back their comments on our, our plan submission. And then we have to return those comments and then they get another 60 days. So average permitting time that we um, present to our homeowners is three to four months. We've seen as short as 60 days, sometimes shorter. We've also seen over 200 days. Um, so it really depends on the municipality. Um, if, if you are looking at uh, building an ADU in a particular municipality, feel free to reach out to me and I can check with our um, permitting team, our city ops team on what our experience has been. Um, just like inspectors, uh, it kind of depends on who you get uh, over the planning counter or the, the building counter. And so this uh, 800 square foot number um, and the 16 foot height requirement and the four foot setback, those are really the only constraints um, to build an ADU. That being said, a municipality can um, have more liberal constraints um, and they can allow a thousand or 1200. I've yet to see anything over 1200. Um, and <clears throat> most cities um, allow two detached units and one conversion on multifamily lots. Um, and we are, with the exception of, you know, Bakersfield and some of these sort of um, off the beaten path cities, we have an active uh, or completed cottage pro uh, project in most um, California cities. Uh, so I'm happy to be a resource for that. The other requirements um, for an ADU, before I move on to that, uh, Nathan was asking, does the four foot setback requirement mean walls have to be four feet from the property or fence line? Yeah, excellent question. Um, without getting too much in the weeds, definitely check that the property line is the fence line. Um, we've seen one to two foot deltas there. Um, so that um, needs to be clarified, uh, ideally with a survey. Um, and then the closest we'll get is four foot wall to four foot property line. Um, some municipalities will judge it by the eave. Most of our ADUs have a 12 to 18 inch eave. Um, so that could mean that we're five feet off uh, wall to property line. Conservatively, most builders want to be about five feet um, just for a little bit of wiggle room. And then the other thing to consider is because you're working with small spaces, not all municipalities allow for your mechanicals to be in that four foot setback. Um, so the trade-off is if I wanna put my mechanicals and that is water heater and, and like a mini split condenser, if I wanna save yard space, jam the ADU to four foot, four foot in the corner, then I'm likely gonna have to have my, um, my utilities, that water heater, uh, those mechanical utilities in, plain sight from the yard. So it's a, a bit of a trade-off there. And and Jimmy, just to, to um, clarify, like th this is kind of why th since 2020, I think ADUs have just been booming um, in, in California. Is And it's my understanding is if your property checks these boxes, in other words, there's a setback requirement, you have space to build 800 square, square foot ADU. It's like pretty much anywhere in California, you can build an ADU on your property. Is that the general gist of it? Correct. Yeah. There are edge cases like if I'm in the Oakland Hills and I'm sitting directly on um, a fault line, um, then there are caveats like that. Um, very rarely have we um, 
I can't even think of a, a project that we've had to disqualify that met these requirements. Um, oftentimes the limiting factor is like, hey, I'm in a landslide zone on a 20% grade and the foundation is going to cost a hundred grand. It doesn't make sense to build even a, a small ADU. Great. Um, does California have any impervious coverage laws that would impact whether or not you could build an ADU? So uh, yeah, great detail here. So these exemptions um, or these qualifiers to be exempt override any lot coverage or FAR, um, floor area ratio. So you've got um, floor area ratio, which is um, different for one story versus two story. If I have a two story, 2000 square foot house, my lot coverage might be a, a thousand square feet, but my floor area ratio would be 2000 square foot as the numerator and then the lot square footage as the denominator. We don't have to worry about lot coverage and, and FAR uh, if we meet these requirements here. For the un, uneducated, what, is the, what does it mean to be an impervious coverage law? Um, Jordan, are you referring to like impervious surfaces? Yeah, and basically just, um, you know, the extent that you can build, like how much building you can build on your, your lot with, uh, you know, without, you know, maxing it out, essentially. I know because in Texas, where I am, you know, there's a certain percentage of the property that has to be allocated towards, let's say, grass um, and things like that. So you're restricted in terms of how much you can build on your property. Yep. Yeah. So um, sub 800 with these other two requirements, um, you are um, you're not uh, not constrained by any any lot coverage. Um, something that we need to consider sometimes is if you have a giant concrete patio um, or a, a large pool that does count for the lot coverage, uh, just not the floor. Right. Area. right. Great. Um, and then we need to maintain, depending on the municipality, at least six feet, sometimes 10 feet of distance uh, from existing structures. So if I'm looking at a property, um, my rule of thumb is as far as eligible space is to um, subtract 10 feet. So if I've got the rear of the house and I have 30 feet until the rear property line, um, I know I'm not going to build an ADU wider than, than 20 feet there. It's an easy just kind of rule of 10. Um, but double check into certain munis who want, who have very conservative fire codes that want you to be 10 feet of distance uh, from any existing structure. That's um, a, sometimes even a trellis or the main home or, or a detached structure. Um, and then we have found ways to get around solar. Most, uh, most of our builds, the homeowners want solar. Um, I can send over a handy solar guide for that. The smaller the ADU, the more likely you are to be exempt from solar. Um, California does require um, a Title 24 energy assessment. Uh, and so if we are building a very efficient ADU, then we can sort of offset the solar requirement there. Great. Um, so this is a fun little map. Um, this is uh, all um, public record that we overlaid on a, an ArcGIS map. Um, the orange is permitted, or sorry, the orange is constructed and the pink is permitted. Um, this is the Bay Area and Southern California. Um, we pulled this uh, information late last year. Um, so well over 40,000 ADU permits have been submitted in California just over the past five years. So they were hot even before the law and, and the law made them uh, take off even more. All right, so let's briefly talk about financing. A uh, number of ways to do it. Um, all of our favorite way uh, to, to pay for anything would be cash if we have it on hand, uh, unless we can get a really good interest rate um, or liquid assets. Uh, I would say 20% of our homeowners um, will pay the majority in cash. Uh, it helps to be in the Bay Area where there's um, quite a bit of uh, of wealth here. Um, conventional loan products. So we've seen a shift from a cash out refinance um, swinging towards the HELOC. So if I have a great 
you know, five-year-old mortgage on my house. I'm not going to do a whole refi just to cash out 250000 for this ADU. I'm likely going to take out a line of credits um, on my home to pay for it, which I'm only paying interest on what I take out. Um, fixed home equity loan is another option. Um, renovation and construction loans, fairly common. Um, the, the catch there, or rather than the catch, the difficulty there is it's just more paperwork. It's a little bit slower moving. You do often have a higher rate, um, but most banks will require some sort of funds control and they will also require um, a draw. Um, that's that's common for general contractors to put that together, um, but the bank just wants to know uh, where every single penny goes. Um, they are doling out the allowance. They have their fingers more, more involved in that build pie. Um, and then um, ADU construction loan is, is quite similar. Um, home equity contracts uh, are an interesting way to um, get uh, a tranche of money um, in exchange for um, future value of your home. Um, if anybody has heard of Point, uh, they run a, a product that is quite interesting. One of my colleagues, uh, his dad um, has been running operations at, at Point for a little while. Uh, so I recommend checking that out. It's just an interesting financial tool. And then um, the infamous Cal HFA ADU grant program. They uh, ran, ran that program uh, last year um, and it was relatively slow. Uh, it was an ambitious effort. Uh, the basics of it were $40,000 uh, grant um, really no strings attached, you don't have to pay it back, it's a grant, um, but it could only be used towards pre-construction costs. So that would be um, any sort of feasibility study that you pay for, uh, any consultants, surveyor, soils reports, um, all of Cottage's work um, for design uh, and, and permitting, permit costs, as well as site prep. So big, um, broad, um, wide area that that $40,000 could go to. Uh, the main issue was they just didn't have much money and, and, and they were slow to process it. Just earlier this year, they released uh, another tranche of money and that has already dried up. Uh, so I put a big asterisk there. Um, people want it to continue. Um, it very may well, but it's kind of like if you're looking to um, get, uh, get a camping spot in Yosemite, you need to be online very early hitting the refresh button to, to get access to that. Um, very few people will use um, a personal line of, of credit uh, for, for our ADU projects. All right, before I get into uh, some of these comps, any questions on, on financing or, or ADU uh, parameters and constraints? I have a quick question. Uh, a neighbor of mine built an ADU of 119 square feet and mentioned that that was under the threshold of needing a permit. Is is that true? Uh, is that a common thing for this small of an ADU? Yeah, I'll preface that with um, not being an expert in accessory structures, um, but I do know that um, 10 by 12, 120 square feet is the max that you can build an unpermitted structure the the use being you know so i can have a shed in my backyard and i don't have to um, go through the city to permit something to store stuff in um i'm unclear on whether or not the fact that he's calling it an adu likely means he has a kitchen and a bathroom um unclear on whether or not um, that is deemed a habitable or livable space by the municipality um it's a good way to get around permits, that's for sure. Um, but I don't know how that would go over if he were to say rent it out, given that it has um, livable features like uh, plumbing and a kitchen. Yeah, just an office. So I'm not okay. sure how that would affect value. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm sure uh, I'm sure he added, added value. Whatever he put in uh, dollar-wise, I'm sure he's going to get back out if he, if he sells that home. Got it. Thank you. Great. Um, so we have, I think I have a, a couple examples of this. Um, detached ADU um, that we built um, in Redwood City. Uh, it was one bedroom, 
um, the comparable home value uh, in the neighborhood uh, was roughly 1.4. Um, we, I believe we built this for between 200 and 250,000. Um, when that home was sold, uh, so note that this uh, 1.4 was not the assessed value of the house before the sale. It was a comp for a similar home in the area. Um, that home was able to sell for 1.9. Um, so quite uh, quite a bit of, of value added there. And another <laughs> example down in Los Angeles, um, similar added value. Uh, million dollar home comp uh, sold for one five, a larger larger ADU to get that same return. Um, quick side note on LA. Um, people tend to think they can build for a lot less money in LA and they think they can build for $150 a square foot. Um, we can build um, at a lower cost in LA, but it's more like 300 a foot. Um, up here in the Bay Area, we're seeing 400 to 450 a square foot. All righty. Um, so I believe, yeah, we got a little little bit of a game here. It uh, doesn't need to be interactive, but uh, if anybody wants to use the handy dandy annotating pen, feel free to draw a little mark of where they think the ADU might have gone. How do you do the pen? Let's see. Oh, whoa. I've never done that. Give it a whirl. Cool. I learned something on Zoom today. Bingo. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> that was cool. Um, let's see. I think. There we go. I can clear. Um, great. So this um, this homeowner um, decided to build an ADU for a, a rear office. Um, if you'll notice, <clears throat> let me go back one, pretty tough property conditions. It's a sloping lot, downward sloping lot. Um, and they actually came to us after they were not able to um, find a way to, to drop in a prefab unit. Um, and one of the things they did want to do was not just build it there on a bit of a slope, but also kind of have it blend in and, and look like it was there for the past 30 years. Uh, so that was a fun project in Hillsboro. Um, and yeah, already sort of uh, covered this. Match the existing home. Um, wanted it to be a lasting um, value addition to uh, the property. And if you can see from this uh, first photo, it's a great garden, um, but it's not really very usable uh, backyard space. Um, so they added um, a pretty good size, 500 square foot, one bedroom ADU. Um, some photos of the the finished product and. This is a great example of um, what a 500 square foot one bedroom would be. Most of our one bedrooms are sort of four to 500 square feet there. So this was actually our first ADU um, down in Palo Alto. Um, yep, nice. That would have been my guess if I weren't on this project. So we actually popped it uh, right there um, in the, I always have to click out of annotate, right in that uh, little covered trellis carport area. Um, pretty small space, um, but one of our more impressive um, projects as far as continuity is concerned. Um, so really cool to see that value add right there. Pretty darn small, 227 square feet. Uh, after this call, if you guys want to measure your bedroom, um, you can probably just double that, and that's the size of this ADU. Um, but the ceilings are massive. They're 17 or so feet. Um, and so really good studio space, full, fully functional kitchen. Um, and they are now renting it. This is down in Palo Alto. They're now renting it to uh, a Stanford graduate student for 2600 a month. Um, so pretty good, uh, pretty good clip of rental income uh, for this one right here. 
So we got another one. And I think in the interest of time, uh, this is probably pretty, pretty easy. It's going to go on the concrete. Um, this one um, right here, large duplex. Um, I was talking with, with Cliff uh, before the call and we have another investor in, um, in Oakland that uh, was able to use a very similar floor plan the um, the duplex option um, is typically only available when you have a multifamily zoned property. And one of the advantages of, even though you're allowed two ADUs that could be detached, um, you'll get about 10% hard cost of construction saving um, by doing what we call a shared wet wall. So you'll notice that all the plumbing and the major utilities are along this wall. That means um, the tradesmen just have to run it through one wall and stub it out. And then all this is pretty simple framing and drywall. Um, so really nice way <clears throat> um, to add two units is this, this duplex um, approach right here. And I, I believe it was just a two unit duplex. And so um, by making this investment, they doubled the number of doors on their property. All right, so a few, uh, few items that may be kind of uh, no-brainers, but helpful to keep in mind when you're looking to identify um, an ADU. The flatter the yard, the better. Uh, we can build on slopes, um, but even with a slight slope, your foundation might be a little more expensive and you're gonna introduce requirements such as a civil engineer or a drainage plan. Um, so the flatter, the better. Um, heritage trees, redwoods and oaks are two of my favorite trees as a California native, but uh, they are showstoppers often um, when it comes to ADUs. Mm -hmm. Access from the street, um, minimum four feet um, will allow us to get in a mini excavator. We do have ADU projects where we've had to hand dig a foundation. It's not the end of the world. Um, but it may it may cost uh, a few more thousand dollars. Um, and then um, what uh, what goes with the three above, um, all of those contribute to a more uh, straightforward foundation process and site prep. We have big trees nearby. We're doing tree protection plans and, and working around roots. If it's sloped, it's more expensive, all that. Um, and then always nice to be close to public transit so you don't have to add another parking space. So here are just a, a few snapshots. Um, a number of these uh, properties, as you can see, um, a lot of them are flat, but varying as far as like what exists there already. Um, so I would say um, I recommend um, if it's a flat lot, trying to put on a set of glasses that imagines it's all just dirt. Um, any of these uh, items can be, um, prepped, uh, you know, small trees, gardens, little sheds, all of that, uh, that can be cleared out uh, in exchange for an ADU. I wanted to throw in this example to sort of show um, what is still possible on a steep lot. Um, this had a 15 to 20% grade, uh, if not greater, it's a property in Los Altos Hills. Um, this is a $900,000, 1200 square foot, two bed, or three bed, two bath ADU. So it's a small home um, and <clears throat> we needed um, extensive consultant work. Um, this is about, I believe a 10 foot um, stem wall of a foundation. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for a good project, try to keep the grade under 5%, but definitely under 10%. That That's remarkable, Jim. And all of that is just kind of all, um, not maybe not in-house, but like when, we, when someone hires Cottage, you all can help with that, that type of project from A to Z from beginning. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and this is all um, all work that we do for the clients um, before we submit for permitting. So um, we want to make sure that they have renderings uh, for the project. They know what it looks like, um, both on, on the um, you know schematic level and also on the elevation level so they can get an idea of, of dimensions. Great. Um, so here's a, a quick little graphic. Um, we are often positioned between uh, prefab on one end um, and traditional de design and architectural design build firm um, or somebody going out finding an architect, finding a GC. Um, we have have 
developed a system that uh, is as flexible as your traditional uh, architect, um, while also allowing us to deliver on a quality product. We also are able to build, like I mentioned before, any type of ADU under the sun. And we're able to be quite a bit faster than a, a traditional design build firm. Um, prefab and modular. Um, the point of reference that I often use um, is an article that uh, came out in the LA Times that said, build your ADU for $126,000. Um, and a couple uh, scrolls down, they had an example of uh, an ADU that was finished by this prefab company. Uh, and uh, the caption read that this was a 600 square foot ADU that was built for $250,000. Um, so devil's in the details. Um, prefab units themselves in a bubble can cost um, a base cost of uh, $100,000 to $200,000. Um, they can come off as pretty cheap, but then you also have to factor in site prep, um, consultant costs, permit costs, and oftentimes um, the cost of a crane. A crane itself can run 30 grand to, to drop it in over a house. Um, so that being said, um, we are not always faster uh, than prefab, um, but we are within 10% on the speed uh, and we're absolutely cost comp competitive when it comes to, uh, to prefab. Great, um, I think we're doing pretty well on time, Cliff. Yeah, 6.12, we have about 20 minutes left. Great, um, so I'll jump into uh, multifamily. Um, so what makes for a great multifamily redevelopment or reinvestment? Um, these are becoming far more attractive to investors. Um, I'm talking to at least two brokers and one investor on the daily um, about uh, properties in their existing portfolios, uh, new acquisitions, <clears throat> or um, brokers may have uh, listings with, um, with some documentation that they want to beef up. Um, so, you know, if you've got a multifamily listing, uh, it's going to show um, number of doors, it's going to show net operating income and cap rate, um, but it won't necessarily show what, uh, what the potential value is if you're to invest in it. Um, and two detached ADUs uh, and 25% of the existing unit counts uh, can be converted. That part's a bit confusing. Um, easiest example is uh, if this were right here, a 12 unit building, then I take 25% of the existing unit count, that gets me three. So then I'm eligible to create three ADUs out of existing space. Um, so that could be um, ground level uh, common space or ground level um, laundry rooms or tuck under parking. Um, the surprising part when I first dove into this is you could have a multifamily property with a carport that is super rickety. It's four poles and a roof, um, and that will qualify as convertible space. Uh, so that's what we did in this example. We actually converted it to a, a duplex and then we were able to add in ADUs uh, below. So a multifamily property with um, you know, a number of a duplex um, is tends to be a great investment, um, but it won't have uh, the same bang as uh, if you have a parking lot in the back um, that you're able to, to convert or put a detached in. Um, another hey, Jimmy, thing to look out Oh, sorry. Um, was this the example where you said it went from a 12 unit property to a 17 unit because of the, the rules in place? Oh, Jimmy. Um, oh, you there? Yeah, I'm still here. I saw I got oh. an internet unstable, so I'm going to pause my video. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, was this the example that you shared earlier with me um, saying this was a 12 unit property and now it's a 17 unit property? They're able to add five units? Correct. Yep. Cool. Wow. Yeah, pretty, pretty big multiplier. Um, I um, I put this here as sort of a, a baseline number. Um, I, I would actually say because even if you had a two-unit multifamily, you can still convert at least one uh, garage. Um, but uh, to be safe, you want to have uh, at least four units. 
Um, and not all municipalities will allow you to round up. So if you have 14 units, 25% um, is not quite four. Um, so you won't necessarily be able to round up to four. Um, but these um, 12 unit and above properties uh, are really where we've been able to um, move the needle uh, in the hundreds of, of basis points for investors. Uh, on, on cap rate, that is. Um, so here, here are a few examples. Um, San Jose, 12 units. Uh, we were only able to add four just due to space. Um, nearly a 20% increase in rentable uh, square footage um, and added uh, quite a bit to the cap rate. <clears throat> and uh, even on this Anaheim example, the reason we were to more than double the unit count was it was a duplex um, that had uh, covered parking. We added two, two detached units and then converted one parking spot. So pretty massive increase in rentable square footage. Um, this right here, um, you know, the three main uh, strategies for a lot of investors with multifamily is I'm either going to rehab this thing, put some money into it. Um, I may uh, up zone or, or redevelop, um, or um, I can do something that's kind of in the middle. It's, it's converting or rehabbing existing spaces um, and then redeveloping existing land um, for quite a bit um, for much lower cost and, and much quicker timeline, um, still able to, to increase uh, the density. And we found that it's, it's just a, a lower risk move. This is an example of sort of how tight you can squeeze things. Um, this was a carport back here, uh, and then we were able to add a duplex right, right in the middle there. Um, so before I get into sort of what the process looks like, uh, any thoughts or questions on multifamily? That, that's super cool for me to see the rendering. Tight is a good word. I was like, wow, that is, that's what I was thinking in my head. I was like, that's pretty tight uh, oh, to yeah. squeeze all that in. But yeah. Great. Um, so this is um, a basic rundown of the four uh, steps in our process. If anybody asks me what Cottage does, um, it's F, D, P, and C. We do the feasibility design, permitting, and construction. We want to handle all four of those major stages. Um, feasibility is, is the quickest. Uh, we can turn around a proposal um, if, if we meet with a homeowner or, or an investor and check out their property. We can turn around an initial proposal in a matter of a couple days. Um, once a homeowner decides to move forward with uh, the project, our design phase is uh, the timeline's contingent upon how quickly does a homeowner want to make decisions and how much do they care about the details. Investors can get through our design phase in, in four to six weeks. Um, and what that involves is um, creating renderings like the ones um, that were up on the screen of that brown um, high sloped ADU, creating elevations, those classic architectural drawings, um, going through and doing finish selections um, for the ADU, picking out tile in the bathroom, countertops, cabinets, flooring, all of that. Um, and then also going through the details of an RCP and electrical plan. So we'll do the reflected ceiling plan, um, all the lighting details, all the structural assembly details. Um, and then we can go into submitting for permits. Um, Permitting um, three to six months, like I said before, could be two months. Um, we'll know well ahead of time if it's going to be longer than six months to set those expectations. Um, if you're at all close to the coast, more of a concern in Southern California, um, double check whether or not the property you have or are considering purchasing is in a coastal zone. Um, that creates uh, a whole nother process of um, administration and, and uh, bureaucratic work that we would need to go through. Um, so after permitting, um, we would then break ground. Um, the way Cottage operates is a marketplace model. So we have um, a tight group of highly vetted general contractors that we are in communication with well before it's time to break ground. Um, we will give our clients um, 
a fixed GC bid uh, at the point at the end point of design. And then we will also do a reprice adjustment after we get first round of comments back. Um, it can be the case that if the building department comes back and says, hey, you need to change this wall assembly, um, if there are impacts to cost, then we'll make sure we do a reprice early. So we're reducing change orders in the construction time. Um, the advantage of having the general contractor involved very early is we know when we're on the cusp of permit approval, we're going to mobilize and break ground on that project within um, a week or two. So we're not waiting in a queue to build with the general contractor. Um, Cliff and I were, were talking about uh, investor projects and the ideal way to operate is to be a machine. You know what you're putting in and you know what you're getting out. Um, this is a well-oiled machine that has taken um, over three years for, for Cottage to, to develop. And we want ADUs to be as plug and play as possible, um, but in a way where you are playing, you are having fun designing, um, and you are not um, sweating about putting in all the project management uh, and bureaucratic time to, to get your ADU. Any questions on this process? Right. Um, so this is, oh, we got a question. How often do you work with people who are pre-close on a property? Somebody who is intentionally looking to buy properties with ADU potential. Um, yeah. So that's something that we are more than happy to do. We need to be careful that um, we're not just taking a look at a dozen different properties for somebody who wants to get free work out of us. Um, at the end of the day, um, if we, if I have bandwidth to take a look at a property, I'm happy to do that. Um, I don't think we've gone into contract with somebody to build an ADU before they have purchased uh, the property, unless they're you know 100% sure they're gonna they're gonna buy that property or they're they're in escrow or something like that. Um, but you know, to some degree, we we do want to operate in a consultative manner. Um, if you are looking at <clears throat> three different homes in Oakland um, and you want us uh, to sort of help you identify um, which one is going to give you uh, a, a knockout investment, um, then we're happy to help out with that. Great. So I will stop sharing. Um, Cliff, I'm more than happy to um, send out this uh, deck in a PDF and you can distribute it to, to everybody in uh, in attendance here. Okay. Cool. That sounds good. I, I, um, are we moving to Q and A, Jimmy? Let's open it up. Okay, cool. I, I had one that I wanted to kind of highlight to the group because I thought, you know, and, and thanks for your presentation. That, that was so great. Um, like you had mentioned that a uh, building price, like the price per square foot to build LA is about 300 Bay Area is four to 400 to 450. Um, I just kind of wanted to highlight that to the group because as, as a real estate agent, the way I kind of think about valuing a home and it's not as easy and straight. it's not just an equation like this but for example here in the bay area like oakland even parts of san francisco uh, you know homes are valued at close to a thousand price per square foot more than that you know some parts of pacific heights rock ridge 1200 1300 price per square foot so if you can build for 400 a square foot and then effectively turn around or you don't even need to sell it right but you're just adding value to your home at what's worth a thousand to twelve hundred per square foot you're kind of instantly kind of creating value there and and so that's one thing I just wanted to, to highlight to the group so that they could kind of, it's you know, see how how I kind of think about it. Um, and then Jimmy, could you maybe share a little bit about like um, pricing, like what goes into a home that's four hundred a square foot versus you know six hundred a square foot on the ADU side? Yeah. Um, so as far as the costs that go uh, into an ADU, uh, the finish level is actually um, the. Uh, lowest multiplier. So I think of it as as three buckets. You're going to have the um, global elements, like the type of site or the type of utilities. If I have a flat lot with newly upgraded sewer, water, and electrical, um, then that portion of the ADU cost is going to be much lower than, um, than the opposite end of that spectrum. And then the middle bucket, um, which is sometimes equally as strong of a lever, is uh, down to the structure itself. So the footprint 
um, but not just the size. Obviously, a 400 square foot is going to be less than a 600 square foot, but we have built 400 square foot ADUs that are almost twice as expensive of a 600 square foot because of the architectural complexity. So if I have a lot of glazing, a lot of door openings, fancy doors, um, and fancy roof line that is not just a straight gable, it's a hip or I have dormers, um, all of that architectural um, design wow is going to add to the cost. And then the lowest impact is uh, is finishes. Um, so you can get away with a really nicely finished ADU that has quartz countertops, um, engineered hardwood or luxury vinyl plank, um, and it looks um, better than rental grade. Um, you can still accomplish all of that um, and keep your cost at 400 a square foot so long as you have a, a standard site and you're not trying to make it look like a Frank Lloyd Wright building, super fancy. Gotcha. Does that four four fifty in the Bay Area per square foot? Does that include permitting and the uh, hiring compass and all in, or is that just the structure itself? Yeah, that's um, that's structure cost itself. Um, you are looking at um, so another uh, three buckets. Um, way to think of it you've got the three buckets in the hard cost but for the whole project you've got three buckets which are hard cost um, soft cost and then permit fees which is technically a soft cost um, the hard cost um, 400 450 a square foot the permit fees um, typically range in the 10 to fifteen thousand dollar range for most municipalities and then the soft cost which would be hiring cottage and then all the consultants um, typically ranges between 30 and 40,000. Um, so most of the time, uh, we're going to be about 15% of the cost uh, of the overall project, um, which is, is a little lower than industry standard. Uh, if you're building a large multifamily project, uh, soft costs could be, uh, in a traditional development model, could be 20 to 30%. If I'm doing that math, so even even with those costs, it maybe is like five fifty a square foot or something all in, but still well 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 below the cost of like if you're trying to buy a home, like you're paying a thousand per square foot for the finished product, but yeah. if you're trying to build it yourself, much much lower. Definitely, and um, you know if you've got the space, uh, it really makes sense um, to go as big as possible, not to eat up your whole backyard if you don't want that type vibe, um, but when it comes to renting a 400 square foot versus a 300 square foot one bedroom, um, you have all of these costs that are necessary to build any size ADU, um, like your utility run and your site prep. So getting that extra 100 square feet, major economies of scale, because you're already doing all this structural global stuff just to get 300 square feet. You mentioned solar as a, a potential requirement for less energy efficient ADUs. Would existing home solar uh, cover anything related to the ADU or is that solar specific for the ADU? Yeah, I like how you think. Um, most of the time we have been able to make a case where the kilowatt hours of an existing homes array um, can at least offset the requirement. Um, and a lot of times um, people may not want to put more solar on the ADU. So they'll just beef up and add to the existing array. Got it. There are also things like shade exemptions. So size is one thing if it's small enough, oftentimes you don't need solar, but if you're in a very wooded area, um, then you can <clears throat> have essentially a variance um, because you're not getting enough sun on the roof for it to be worth it anyways. Mm. Jimmy, I love as you answer these questions because it sounds like such a s simple question that someone tees up, but it real you realize how complicated it is. But also, it's nice to just know how, like, hear how much knowledge you have about all these subjects, like shade array, all these like things. It's like so so nuanced, so many so so detailed. Yeah, I mean, there are just so many elements that go into a uh, an ADU, and you know, I don't know too much about cars, but like if I'm trying to fix a car, there are hundreds of elements that go into making a car function. Um, there are thousands of elements that go into a building structure. Um, and and that what that brings to mind is 
um, you know, a value prop of our general contractors is they stick to ADUs. Um, if, if you're going to hire, um, a general contractor who's a great general contractor, but he builds, he or she builds homes only, um, it's a different beast, uh, dealing with ADUs. Um, and the types of requirements for utility connections uh, or slightly different building code requirements. So um, whether you go with cottage or not, um, I would never build an ADU with a general contractor that hasn't built at least one or two ADUs before. Well, I think we're kind of at time. Any any other questions from folks? This has been so 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 good. Awesome. Yeah, appreciate uh, you guys taking the time to listen to me talk about uh, these these ADUs. Uh, there's a lot of fun in them. And I hope that uh, if you guys have any properties that might have ADU potential, um, that you can make something happen and make a little bit of money off it. Jimmy, thank you very much for the time. And Cliff, thanks for setting it up. This is super helpful. Thanks for joining, Masaki. Um, all right, cool. Yeah, I, I will send out the slide deck. Send out Jimmy's contact info. Hope you all found this informative and thanks for um, tuning in. I know people are probably anxious because in 30 minutes there's tip off for the Warriors. I know, I know. I missed part of my Lakers game actually right now. So I need to check the score. So, um, but hope you all have a good night. And um, thank you. Thanks again, Jimmy. Appreciate your thanks, time. Cliff. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Cliff. Yeah, thank you, Jimmy. Thanks, guys. Bye.